Hi, everyone. I am so happy that you are here. I am Dr. Anya. I teach at Mercer University. I teach mostly marketing courses. I also teach research courses and analytics courses. So I tend to be on the more quantitative side, which I'll mention later on when there's a good time for it. But I mostly teach consumer behavior, social media marketing, product innovation, um, research, like I said, and some other marketing uh, fun classes. I am a business owner. I, um, I own Lux Leonis Skincare. It's a self-care um, business with candles, skincare, hair care, and so on. And it's been a fun ride to do that in addition to my jet day job as a professor here at Mercer University. I got my PhD, uh, PhD, master's and undergrad at Florida State University, where I also played on the tennis team. So I have a unique background uh, when it comes to my education and my experiences. So without further ado, I would like to talk about netnography and spotting your uh, spotting opportunities for your business via social media. I have published some work on netnography uh, uh, using the ethnographic approach, uh, but I also published other research on uh, marketing and specifically building connections with your customers. So this falls right into my area of expertise as a professor, but also is really useful in my uh, business in the beauty industry. So if I have any one of you that is in the beauty industry, don't, don't hesitate to ask any questions or reach out to me later on. Um, but this approach is useful for many businesses, which again, I'll cover a little later. So let's get, uh, let's get into it without much more waiting. So let's see if I can figure this one out. All right. So first let's talk about environment, right? We are conducting business in some environment. It doesn't happen in a vacuum, whether you're small business or a large corporation, there's an environment in which you operate. So we divide this environment, we marketers, we divide this environment into two, two distinct areas, right? The foci, so to speak. We have external environment, and we have internal environment. Whether it is crisis time, like right now, we are in crisis still, or your day-to-day -day operations, you always have to keep track of your external environment. Your external environment consists of political environment, economic environment, technology, cultural environment, and so on. You always want to keep track of that. Every time there is a political change, so like we just had elections, there are a number of changes policy-wise that will affect your business. In fact, last go around, we had tariffs and that hugely affected my business where we had major uh, price hikes um, from day one to another. So um, you always want to keep track. So in order to anticipate potential changes that may affect your business. Economic environment um, is a very important one as well. With COVID and uh, the subsequent recession, we know that consumers tend to spend less for two reasons. They have either less money or there is a higher risk of purchase. And they're more concerned about <clears throat> the weight um, every purchase may carry and how it may affect their future. So every time there is an economic recession or instability of any sort, uh, spending goes down immediately. You also want to keep track of technology, technology um, innovation, because it can threaten your business if your customer, not customers, but if your competition gets hold of good technology and you're sort of lag behind, uh, they can get ahead. Or technology can also be an opportunity for you. So every time there is a new technology, there could be an opportunity for you to either better your product, provide a better service, or just improve your processes. Culture environment in which usually your consumer is your consumer tends to be part of a culture, and changing cultural environment will affect consumer, will affect preferences, 
will affect the values that uh, your consumer has and those that are important to him or her. So you always want to keep track. And finally, last two, you want to keep track of your consumer, of course, needs and wants that your goal is to satisfy. Your goal is to satisfy consumer needs and wants uh, via product uh, that you're offering. And by product, I mean either good or service. Um, so product, whenever I say product, I mean anything from good to service. So um, satisfying consumer needs is important in marketing and in any, any business because happy customer is more likely to return. But competition, you also want to uh, keep track of competition. I often hear in my industry and from my fellow um, business uh, owners never to really keep track of competition because it's irrelevant, but it is very relevant. And not in a sense of, um, of maybe copying your competition, but knowing what they're doing so that you can get, become innovative yourself as well. So you always want to keep track of external environment because any changes in external environment will affect your business and your customer. Second, you have to keep track of your internal environment. So resources, human resources, do you have uh, good employees, happy employees, do knowledgeable employees and efficient employees? That's very important. You need to know your strengths and your weaknesses. So for me, my strengths are my formulations but my weakness, for example, tends to be the shipping time, mostly because of my um, day, day job, right? Being a professor, that takes uh, some time. So that happens all the time, whether we are in crisis or not. So what about current environment? Well, COVID changed everything. So change everything we do, literally, how we do it, how customers shop, their priorities, everything that we know has been affected one way or another, right? So um, stay at home orders, change our priorities, change how we shop online. Consumers who previously never shopped online suddenly started shopping. Their habits have changed, their habits have formed. We've been in a pandemic for over a year now. So uh, it usually takes 20 odd days to build a new habit. So consumer start, consumers started to build new habits, got more comfortable shopping online if they haven't, uh, haven't been comfortable before. So those behaviors are probably there to stay. Although many consumers will be happy to come back to um, in-person shopping. Now we are here in Georgia, there, there hasn't been many really differences um, in day-to-day -day behaviors, but in other places, um, of the United States certainly have been. Um, consumers' expectations may have changed. Expectations to shipping time, there have been many delays. There may be slightly more forgiving with USPS and their delays and missing packaging. Uh, that, that information has been all over the news. Um, that has affected their expectations in terms of um, wait times but also expectation with respect to sanitation and social distancing. So those expectations perhaps haven't been there before, but they popped up because of COVID-19. And finally, social cultural environment. Let's not forget what 2020 has brought, right? So first COVID, uh, we were forced sort of to stay home with stay at home orders. We started working from home. We have had more exposure to social media. We have had, or our social media consumptions has increased tremendously. Uh, we have listened to more news and uh, combined with a political environment, like I said, COVID, we've heard more things, right? Uh, some information on social media was factual, some not so much, but it doesn't matter really whether you know which information is factual or not, it's important to what your customer thinks and perceives. So this frequent exposure to news media um, and social media affected what we see, how often do we see that. And that includes fires in West Coast for extended period of time, people started paying more attention to environment, then death of George Floyd and subsequent um, 
demonstration. All of this together affected your consumers greatly. So Anya, a question yes. did, did come up already and it has to do with the shopping habits. And yes, the, the, I'm gonna paraphrase, paraphrase the question, mm -hmm. but it was talking about grocery stores. And as, as people were uh, more into their homes and not wanting not to go wanting out to shopping, shopping, they wound up using um, this Instacart. Is there, is there an opportunity for this not only to, to, to continue, and is this necessarily a good thing for consumers and for the publics and Kroger's of the world? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Actually, um, it's hard to tell what is actually going to happen, but thanks to netnography, I could tell you that I found out that many customers found it very convenient suddenly. Why would I even go into a store when I just can have it all prepped and loaded? Uh, right, so many customers have learned this behavior and they appreciate the behavior. So there are a couple opportunities um, in terms of improving even technology further, uh, providing some improved customer service, loyalty rewards, and job opportunities for individuals to help this specific sector of um, grocery shopping. There is some threat in terms of well, if the customers are not going to go through the shelves, right, of the grocery store, they will not, they potentially may not pick up those random things that we tend to pick up as we walk through a uh, grocery store. So there will be potentially reduced spending on those random items that we didn't plan on buying. Uh, so you will have to figure out, um, from a grocery store perspective or any retail space, how to get consumer into the retail area by providing maybe other types of rewards or maybe some exper experiential elements. So the strength of retail space over, let's say online or Instacarting is um, the experience, right? So the Instacart of any sort cannot offer you the experience the consumer will actually have going in. So you have to bump up that experiential element of retail shopping in order to sort of win the customer and get them back in the store. I hope that answers the question. So there are two elements, two opportunities, so, so to speak. One, it does. the experiences in Instacarting and the other one by bumping up the experiential element of retail shopping. And so, I think like anything, it becomes something that, as you said, with a habit, people are sitting back and saying, gee, this is easy. I like shopping this way. I don't mm -hmm. have to go out or my busy schedule now allows me to do something else. So I think your yeah. answer was right on target. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, let you get back on to your next. Let me just add one more thing. We have two types of actually value that we get out of shopping. Utilitarian, basically get the, the job done. I need bread. I need milk. I need whatever I need for dinner and be out of there, right? So I think Instacarting will help with that. Um, but we also have hedonic, which is the experiential part, like I said, for fun, for the, for the fun of it, right? So the people who are um, not so much afraid to go into the um, retail space, they still want to have fun shopping. So if that fun shopping, I think will be more in the retail space rather than Instacarting. Sure. And I shop with my eyes, so I know, <laughs> and, not, and I, don't, I don't particularly like shopping shopping, but I do a lot of grocery shopping and I enjoy going in there. And if I go to the meat counter and I see this great hunk of beef there, it's like, yep, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm probably not going to see it online and be drawn to it. So That's right. Steak for dinner. That's just because right. you saw it. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's exactly that. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Great question. All right. So changing priorities, we've done <laughs> to actually talk, continue talking about the Grocery, we've done hell a lot. Oops, sorry, heck a lot of baking. Um, in uh, can we beep that out? <laughs> uh, we did a lot of baking, so we had bread baking mania, right? We the there was no flour, no yeast. Um, I think sourdough starters have um, have disappeared from uh, offerings for a while. There, it was really hard to get because the priorities were suddenly to not go to a store but do it yourself. So you could see if you were on social media, you can see a ton of uh, delicious food cooked by your friends. Um, 
So, but ch it's change also needs, right? So right now you can see me here on Zoom or webinar, you can see the top part. Um, I'm wearing a jacket and I don't know what I'm wearing, a shirt. Um, but the bottom, you know, party on the top or professional on the top, party on the bottom. Uh, so people could wear whatever they want, jeans to a meeting. So suddenly this has changed to get, people were buying ring, ring lights to look good on the camera, um, making themselves look good, the top part, but the bottom wasn't important. At the same time, less consumption of suits because you were not tra traveling to professional meetings. So lower consumption of maybe dry cleaning, which then threatened the business of dry cleaning. So those changes in needs have affected our consumption and ultimately our wants, right? Do we really need a ring light? Well, we don't, but we do want to look good in Zoom meetings and so on. So those changes um, did affect what we actually, the value of product, right? What was important to us versus what it was not. Like in my business, suddenly we were offering a lot of kits. Like I started to offer kits for moms to do with their children, right? Like lip balm kit or do it yourself, some sort of kit. So moms could, and dads too, um, want to do, uh, could do things with their children, things that before maybe they were not so much interested in doing, but by being at home, um, they had to come up with some things to do, right? So um, again, changing priorities, needs, and wants. So how do we find out what those needs and wants are? Again, the, our goal is not just to make money. Our true real goal is goal is to satisfy the needs and wants of a customer. We serve the customer, right? So if those needs and wants change, if those priorities change, how will we know? Some things are obvious, but some aren't. So you have two main ways of conducting research um, on consumer, right? Quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative would be those questionnaires where you answer um, on a scale, maybe from one to seven, how likely are you to purchase a product or whatever that may be, right? So this is usually a quantitative choice. We can do predictive modeling uh, from this. We can do descriptive analysis, some, some basic quantitative stuff. We can make also advanced uh, quantitative um, research like exper experimental design. So this is like trials. The, you've heard a lot about um, medical trials now because of the vaccine, but we do that too in marketing. We conduct experimental research, which has the same rules like the trial, medical trials. Qualitative research is your second option, and you can do it via interviews, basically one-on-one, -on -one, having a conversation with your consumer, or focus groups. When you have a conversation, a question, sort of question answer a situation with a group of people who are similar to one another in some way or another. Now with the pandemic, it makes it hard being face-to-face -face because of, well, pandemic. So um, options are to do it via phone, which people usually don't want to do it. They don't pick up the phones or via internet, which again, it's time constraint and most people don't want to do it. And there's also the element, whichever research you do, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, uh, people know that they are being studied and they may provide desirable answers. So answers they think you want to hear or answers that improve their image because they don't want to be judged. Second disadvantage of these type of uh, research methods is that um, they do require a analyst, probably somebody skilled. Not every small business has that and not every small business or large even business, right? Has the ability to have a team of highly skilled individuals with uh, advanced degrees. You know, I teach analytics and that really is not an easy subject. I can tell you by the faces of my students every time I introduce a new, new subject. So these type of methods require skilled and often costly uh, task force and uh, human resources. But there are a couple of things you could do yourself, whether you're small business or larger business, even if you're a large corporation, you could have a team to do that for you. And that is netnography. 
So what is netnography? Netnography is type of qualitative research, actually. It's not really quantitative. It stems from ethnography. Ethnography is an old, old method of doing research and is comes from anthropological, anthropolo, <laughs> anthropological research, anthropology. There we go. Uh, and it used to study groups, um, maybe tribes, maybe small communities. Um, and a researcher became part of that community and tried to um, observe the participants of communities and draw their conclusions. Netnography stems, like I said, from ethnography and it um, takes place in a virtual setting. So this is your major benefit now, especially. Everybody during the pandemic, um, not everybody, but most people spend a lot more time online than they did before. And they're willingly sharing their thoughts, opinions, you know, it is everywhere, right? Uh, those thoughts and opinions, whether you want them or not, people are willingly sharing there for you to literally grab and analyze. So uh, what could be a community in from a business perspective? Okay, so from a business perspective, it may be people who have similar interests. So for me, it would be people interested in beauty, right? Um, maybe a company, large company like Nike would be interested in people who are physically active. So maybe some gym junkies or just people who love to stay active. Um, maybe hikers, that would be a, a completely different group of people, but you can have gardeners, you can have people who travel a lot. There's a group or there's a community for every interest out there. The, the important part would be to make sure that whatever group you actually try to tap into and collect information on is mirrors or is the same as your target market. So target market are individuals who you can serve with your product offering best. So choose the community that you are trying to serve, right? Not just any random community. <clears throat> so how to conduct a netnography. First, you have to enter social media groups or any virtual groups, right? That um, can be on Facebook. You can start reading Reb Reddits on a particular topic. And that becomes a community of people interested in the same thing. There are a lot of groups out there that are literally readily um, available for you to explore. You will have to, you know, have an account most of the time to enter these groups because they are not always um, public. There are, there tend to be private. So not everybody can read the post. You can only read them if you enter the group. So you enter the group. <clears throat> and for me, that would not be a group of uh, business owners like myself in the beauty industry, but uh, a um, group of customers, so people interested in the beauty and the consumer of beauty. So again, not business owners. Uh, your goal is then to, once you enter the group, become a member, you need to start observing. And this may be the hardest part, you observe and you don't interact. You're not there to ask questions for people to answer, you're just there to watch. And then you need to collect data. How do you collect data? Usually you collect by screenshotting. It is, you don't share them in other groups because that's all often a violation of group policies, but you save them for yourself and start analyzing them. And again, kind of keep track of policies, right? Um, maybe screenshots may not be available, so you may have to take notes. Uh, the old school side, uh, old school way, or you may have a recorder and start, uh, you, you may want to take notes um, audio recording yourself uh, from your observations. So, uh, but most of the time screenshots, screenshots work. You take screenshots of most conversations and um, at some point you're going to start collecting a lot of them. It's, it's a timely, it's a consuming, uh, it's a consuming process. But once you have some of that, you can begin to analyze, right? Um, and how do you do that? 
Well, in quantitative research, so not in ethnography, uh, usually you have an idea what you're looking for, right? If you are having some sort of forecasting, if you do some sort of statistical modeling, you are the one choosing which variables would be important or uh, what is important to put into your model. In ethnography, it's, it's much, much more sort of flexible. It's a different approach. You have all this data and you allow findings to emerge from your data. So let me give you some examples. You may want to have, <clears throat> you will have some themes emerge from data. And by, by this, I mean things like, um, let me just say in cosmetic industry, right? You hear a lot of people saying, a lot of consumers saying, oh, I don't want any toxic ingredients, right? That would be a theme. People talking about toxic ingredients all the time. So that is one major discussion point going on and they keep posting it over and over again. Yes, Jeff. So, and I, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I just thought this was a timely question that came up. As you talk about analyzing, is there a, <clears throat> how often you do this? Does it, does it get done on a regular basis? Is it important to do it? Or do you just do it every so often whenever you feel like it? What's the recommendation there? That's a great question. So the question, <clears throat> so you would conduct ethnography after every major occurrence. So when George Floyd happened, you definitely want to see what cons consumers are talking about, right? Um, <clears throat> then we had fires. I mean, 2020 was like, one major event on the other, right? We had COVID, we had George Floyd, we had fires, we had, you know, economic, political election. Let's not forget about that. <clears throat> so typically you would go after every major event, but also you would do some ethnography on sort of weekly, bi-weekly basis. So like, I like to go in once or twice a week and just read. You know, you don't have to screenshots and go all that scientific way like I do, <clears throat> excuse me, but you can just read and see what is it that my customers are talking about? What is it, right? So checking on them once or twice a week, that is a good method. Just set it up Monday, 10 o'clock after I check my emails, I'm just going to go into the my, my communities and check what they're talking about. Scroll through the post and see what major themes are occurring, right? So like I said, uh, one thing may be toxic, um, toxic free skincare or more so chemical free skincare. I'm not sure what a chemical free anything is because everything is really chemical from water to air. So we have to dig deeper. What does it actually mean to a consumer, right? A lot of times um, the, so the node or the another information under the theme would be actually fear, right? So beyond the obvious. So when talk, consumer talks about um, chemical free product, you may want to go into, okay, what, where is it coming from, right? And it may be from fear because somewhere, and it takes me back to factual or non-factual information, somewhere they may have read that something causes cancer or it's just harmful. So um, sometimes the solution is fairly easy, yet complex, and it would be education, right? Um, another thing also in beauty industry would be packaging. Like I found out through my ethnography that consumers really display the product. It never occurred to me that consumers would be displaying the product. So packaging matters, right? Um, and also display matters. We have a notion of shelfies. So uh, consumers taking um, not selfies, but shelfies. So pictures of their uh, display of cosmetics. We have similar notion in another industry like um, athletics. Adidas made a study with Dr. Kozinets who actually talks about it on YouTube, which you can check it out. Uh, he, he gives an example of um, Adidas shoes, he explored a community of people who like to wear sport shoes. And um, I think he did this for Adidas. 
Um, but his findings were that people like two things, two main themes. Again, uh, we have here customization. They likes to, like to customize their shoes and they like to display their shoes, but there are no display options. Most people keep their shoes in boxes and may have a picture of um, their, their um, shoe on the box so they know which one is which. So here came the opportunity. The opportunity was to create a shoe that is customizable with some customization options from, uh, from that shoe company and display case for the shoe, huge opportunity. And apparently it sold out almost instantly. So it definitely was a great way of spotting opportunity in a social media setting because customers were willingly providing that information. And somebody who was sharp enough to go in with a with sort of free mind to learn what customers are saying uh, was able to spot that opportunity, right? You may also spot potential threats. And again, that takes me sort of back to that chemical-free, toxic-free um, idea is that consumers may think that a, an ingredient is bad and you may have that ingredient in your product, whether it's food, whether it's a drink, whether it's skincare, it doesn't really matter here. And it doesn't even matter if that is that perception of product uh, of ingredient is being ingredient being harmful is factual or not, or is it science based or not? Because what consumer perceives is that consumer's reality. If you have a lot of consumers having the same notion of something being harmful, that can be potentially threatening to your business unless you either educate the consumer or B, change your formulation. Um, so again, those things are um, gr great. Uh, Nanography could be a great way of um, you know, spotting opportunities, but also spotting potential threat to your business because consumers are talking about those things. Now, if you see just one theme, one conversation, that probably is just consumer renting. It doesn't mean, that may not mean much. But if you see consumers, all sorts of consumers talking about um, the same thing over and over, you see number of different posts on the same topic, that may tell you that there is relevance um, on that topic. And that's definitely you should, that's something you definitely should pay attention to. And that's the biggest strength of netnography, especially if you, let's say, go in and once a week to kind of check on your communities to keep tabs all on what is being talked about, that will be a great strength um, for you in catching those opportunities or even potential threats, but definitely in changing needs, right? What cost customers really uh, need right now. So um, in my ethnography, I should probably add while I'm here on the slide and my scientific research, I found out that um, corporate socially social responsibility matters, even now with COVID, right? So we want to make sure that the employees are conduct are doing their job in safe environments, not just for you as a um, customer, but also for them. You care about the treatment of employees if you support a business. You care, many or many customers care about social justice. Um, so even in the times of economic turmoil, while customer own well-being is a threat, customers still cares about others. And that was a, a very important finding for me in my research, um, right, that is currently being published. So I think um, keeping track ongoing changes is going to be very important for you. Okay, let me move on from that slide. All right, so here are some tips. As you organize these frequent consumer conversation into major topics or major themes, trying to figure out the sources of concerns or sources of excitement, because it doesn't always have to be a concern. It may be excitement about something that, I don't know, people talk about. Um, 
you need to keep your bias in check. And that is probably the hardest thing of any qualitative research and ethnography especially. Uh, is, as you read through those uh, social media posts that your consumers are making, again, willingly, uh, you may be tempted to roll your eyes or think, oh my goodness, <clears throat> this is so full of nonsense. And here's the thing, you can't do that. You cannot let your own knowledge, which you probably should have heightened level of knowledge in your respective business, um, or your political views, or your own beliefs affect how you view uh, those posts or how you analyze those posts. You need to keep your bias in check. If some posts get you angry or frustrated, or if there are customers, if customers happen to be um, criticizing your own business, I know that hurts. You have to slow down and stop yourself and think, okay, right now, this is my business and I know that all the feelings I'm feeling are normal, but I need to keep them in check. Remind yourself to keep those feelings in check, political views, whatever that may be, that leads to a bias, um, you need to keep that in check. Otherwise, you will end up introducing garbage to your data and getting garbage solutions. You're not going to have uh, really accurate findings findings, and that is, of course, problematic to your business and potentially threatening to your business. <clears throat> Look beyond the obvious. The obvious part here, um, it's, you know, it's easy to see that people don't want toxic um, or chemicals on their faces, but go beyond the obvious. What is the core? What is the main reason that um, people, people go there, right? So in order to find solution, in order for those things that you're reading to become an opportunity, you need to go beyond the obvious and find the real reasons for things um, happening. A lot of times people get used to doing things and um, they don't see a problem with it. So when you go in and watch people talk about these things, you will see a potential for opportunity. So again, look beyond the obvious, yes. So a question came up, especially with this slide. And in addition to what you've mentioned here about watching your bias, look beyond the obvious, are there particular, and this is a two-part question, are there particular personality traits that will, uh, will really be good at ethnography? And is data analytics really key and important for somebody to have a, a good handle on how to deal with data analytics to do, to do well or be successful with ethnography? So let me address the analytics part with ethnography. You do not have to be an analyst at all as far as quantitative analytic, analysts or statistical anal analysis. You do not need any of that for ethnography. Ethnography is sort of, um, is your way of seeing, you literally are reading it and making conclusions based on what you're reading, right? So there's no statistics involved at all. Even though I am mostly known for my uh, statistical expertise, I do that too. And then I need to put my statistics aside and stop, just not use it because ethnography is not a statistical tool or research method. It is a method of sort of observation and drawing conclusion based on the things you see. What was, oh, psychological traits. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. Um, a lot of really comes to, tr to training. Um, you may not be trained. Um, not everybody can be trained sort of technically, uh, but once you start doing it, practice this. Let me give you homework. Go to your, any, any um, even your own friends, right? Just don't tell them. Scroll through your feed and scroll, read the feed and start seeing, start, and if you're in any groups, do it in any group. Um, start seeing the patterns. And by patterns, I mean, what are the commonly, frequently occurring conversations that people are having? So now let's give an example from a healthcare industry, right? So healthcare communication, we have, vaccines 
and I know I'm going to rock the boat right now, but I'm just going to do it. It's my job. So we're going to have people that are pro-vaccine, pro-COVID vaccine, and we're going to have people anti-COVID vaccine, right? So vaccine vaccination is going to be sort of main theme. Then we're going to have under that people who are pro and against vaccine. Under that, you're going to have some frequently occurring reasons why people don't get vaccine or why people do get vaccine, right? So this is how you, you can start doing this, just practice, and it will help you start seeing things beyond the obvious. And obviously with COVID it's harder because some of it was politicized. So that, that adds this emotional layer to it that um, comes with anything that has to do with the politics but that's a healthcare industry. Yeah, so you don't need statistical training. Is there, um, I don't think so. If there is a psychological trait that makes it better, I'm not sure, I am not going, I'm not gonna try to make it up. But the more you practice it, try to practice on your own friends list or your own favorite groups, just keeping that bias in check and you start seeing things and you will be in awe how fast that becomes a habit for you and how easy, it's never super easy. You always kind of have to work on it, uh, but it's going to become easier in uh, seeing these, these themes and potential opportunities for your business. So I think that is a good, uh, good news for those businesses who A, are, um, you know, entrepreneur of one like myself, um, smaller businesses with small teams who you may not be able to hire a advanced or analytical individual, right? Analytics person, statistics person. And, um, or even if you're large business, but you know, even large businesses are tight on their money right now. So um, you can have somebody design in your team that you can sort of train on that. Are there any other questions? Are you muted, Jeff? Thank you. When we are looking at large amounts of information, will analytics, statistics help you with your analysis? Is text analysis helpful? Yes, textual analysis is very helpful. If you have actually somebody on your team able to do a data mining and textual analysis, it does help. With um, Netnography, there is slight advantage of netnography because you can get um, some information that is hard for the computer to um, pull out. But even with text analysis, you can get some emotional analysis associated with it um, done. So uh, if you have tons of information, absolutely textual analysis is a way to go, yes. You can do it and you can then quantify it. So if we want to get more specific, with this textual analysis, uh, text, text is unstructured data, right? Hard to analyze. So what we would do with a data mining technique and textual analysis, you begin to structure that data somewhat, and then it's easier to analyze statistically. So you can take it another level, uh, but then it's not an, an ethnography anymore. It becomes textual analysis. Okay, I think that's that's good. So do you have more slides to go through? No, I don't have more slides, but I do have a okay. couple comments because sure, sure. I did give um, some examples from beauty industry because simply it's easy for me uh, and shoot sports shoe industry because of my uh, athletic background also easy to me. And uh, in my PhD, I had a professor who was in healthcare. So again, my interest in actual COVID and um, vaccine communication comes from there as well. But there are various of different fields you can, there's no limit on the industry that you may be uh, looking into, right? Um, people from Amazon should be doing, Amazon should be doing that too. There's a ton of people having a conversation on Amazon and I'm sure Amazon is doing either textual analysis or an ethnography, uh, but Big companies like L'Oreal, Adidas, I mentioned, they do that too. And the netnography specifically, because 
you know, some things that uh, the looking beyond obvious is very hard for a computer to pick out. But um, hospitality industry, hotels, right? Uh, there's a new trend uh, of boutique hotels. Because of COVID, there's a great opportunities for smaller B&Bs and, um, and uh, boutique hotels to learn from the needs. The weddings, we're probably going to cut down from you know, the 200 people weddings to smaller 20 people weddings for a little while. Um, so this can, can be used in any from smallest business of uh, entrepreneur of one all the way to a major, major industries and big companies, like I say, use it too. So it's a very useful technique, different from textual analysis, uh, but, um, but still very useful. And I really uh, recommend it, even though it's not my primary um, interest. So is there ever an opportunity people looking for jobs, will they see the title netnographer out there? Oh, that's a good question. This is a fairly new, uh, like I said, Dr. Kozinet, I think in the 90s, maybe, or 2000, he, um, he wrote, he, he started talking about this. I think it is going to be a growing opportunities. And right now, what you may see is a qualitative researcher uh, with maybe netnography specialization, but I'm not 100% sure about this. But I think there is a huge opportunity to become an ethnographer in the future. Sounds like a skill for people to start working on, add it to their, their list of skills they already have and how valuable it can be, whether they are doing it for their own business or mm -hmm. working for somebody else to show trends and to show direction they should be taking with their products and services. Exactly. I should probably add to it that when I was getting my PhD, which was over 10 years ago. So when I was getting my PhD, we were talking more about ethnography. Ethnography, like I said, has been around for a long time and there are ethnographer jobs out there. And ethnography is just more specific for a virtual setting. And with the internet, I don't see, I don't see this not growing even bigger.